and welcome to another edition of our Treatment of the International Sunday School Lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, Living in Faith. And it's taken from the book of Acts, 6th chapter, verses 7 through 15. And it's for March the 24th, 2024, spring quarter, lesson number now, a little background information. Today's lesson is talking about the period of time after the church began to grow. And if you stop and think about it, the when Jesus was crucified and then he rose from the grave and then 40 to 50 days later ascended up into heaven, and the day of Pentecost happened, and they were great preaching that Peter did. There were a lot of people saved then. And then the uh, disciples, the new converts, went out and told all their friends about everything. And so there was a lot of jealousy and hostility beginning to brew after this great move of God. And you will often see that happen in various situations where the Spirit of the Lord will begin to move and people will beginning to get jealous of the move of God and they will stir up things trying to uh, counteract the move of God. Uh, that's, uh, uh, and it's out of jealousy usually. And that's what, from when you read between the lines, that seems to be what happened here. Okay? Now, Acts 6 and 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So we see here how that even some of the folks that were part of the religious institution, the members of the priesthood, began to be converted and become Christians. And this triggered so much jealousy among the those in religious authority. You know, that same kind of thing happened in Jesus' day. We see in the book of John, the 12th chapter, verses 42 through 43, says, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And this is one of the catastrophic things that we see happening in a lot of times when there is a great move of God. There will be a group of people who will love the glory from men more than they will love the glory that comes down from God. But regardless Regardless what kind of persecution and um, battle we get from those who are jealous, we are commanded to preach the word. Jesus, right before he left, said in Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen, and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now notice that Jesus did not say, go into all the world and get them to send you a thousand dollar seed faith. He didn't say go on to all the world and get them to vote for the presidential candidate that you believe in. He said go into all the world and preach the soul-saving gospel. 
the blood-bought, soul-saving gospel. The Holy Ghost-empowered, blood-bought, soul-saving gospel. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission of all ministers, is to preach that soul-saving gospel. And that's what we need to do. Regardless whether or not we're uh, being fought against by the people that are full of the world. Okay? Now, Acts 6 and 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So we see here how Stephen, one of the first deacons in the house of God, how that God had filled him and he was making a testimony and he was winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for godly deacons. I have had the privilege of knowing some very godly deacons who would get out there and win souls for the Lord, who would teach Sunday school classes, who would do the work of God and thank God for them. You know, Paul was talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, not but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be husband of one wife, manage, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Thank God for godly deacons. Okay? Now, Acts 6, 9, and 10. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit which, which, with which he was speaking. Now, in the King James Version, the freedmen are called the Libertines. And it may very well be, I've read several big discussions about exactly who the Libertines were. And there have been over the course of the last 2,000 years, there's been a lot of discussion about exactly who the Libertines are, the freedmen. It may possibly have been that they were uh, tied to a particular geographical area. Uh, that does not seem very likely at all. More than likely, they were a group of folks that had been freed from slavery under the Roman Empire, and that's why the uh, ESV calls this group the freedmen. Um, okay? Now, um, Matthew 10, 19 and 20. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. So the Lord is promising the Christians that when they are brought up on charges and the devil is trying to do them in and they're suffering persecution and they're being brought up before the councils and being brought up before court, that the Lord Jesus would fill them with his Spirit and give them what they need to say. And we see that's exactly what ended up happening with Brother Stephen, where he was going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and he would be given exactly what he needed to say. Okay? Now, Acts 6, 
11 and 12. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard them speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. So they see we see here how they uh, conspired and they got some people to commit perjury and to give these false accusa ac accusations against Stephen. Okay? And this happened multiple times throughout the book of Acts. We found this happened maybe three or four times with Brother Paul. We know one time it happened in Acts 17 and 13. And when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Okay? Now, Acts 6, 13 through 14. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And we know that that place was destroyed. That the temple was torn down. Was it much many years after this? There was a catastrophic assault on Jerusalem that this was completely brought to pass. But these lying witnesses had made it sound like like uh, he was preaching that Jesus was going to destroy that place and to do that place in. Okay. And they brought false accusations against Jesus, too. Matthew 26 and 59. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. And we see that happen a lot during persecution, where the devil will get people to lie on Christians. In the early days of the church, because of the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, uh, where, you know, they were saying, drink his blood and eat his body, they were trying to uh, say that Christians were into cannibalism, which was ridiculous. Okay? Now, Acts 6 and 15. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Wow. Have you ever seen anybody get full of the Holy Ghost and be preaching or teaching and the whole continence of their face changes? I have. And it is a beautiful sight to have or to see. And we know that that's what, exactly what happened with... Uh, Stephen here, okay? Now, Ecclesiastes 8 and 1 talks about a similar thing where it says, Who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. So, we see again even in the Old Testament where that continence changes. Okay? Well, friends, a couple of concluding thoughts. First off, don't be misled in thinking you're never going to experience prejudice. There are times where you more than likely will experience prejudice. Now, let's be real clear about something. If you deadbeat somebody and you owe them a bill and they call you to try to collect that debt from you and you legitimately owe it and they are talking rough to you, that is not Christian persecution. That's <laughs> somebody trying to collect a debt. If you cut somebody off 
on the freeway and about wreck them and they get all mad and huffy and start giving you all these nasty signs, that's not Christian persecution. That is, you cut them off and about had a wreck and you did something silly and stupid but not paying attention. Okay? Christian persecution is only when you have not done anything silly, stupid, mean, or dishonest with somebody. It's when you are being experiencing something only because you are testifying of the grace and goodness of God. And that is Christian persecution. And it may also be because you stood up and you called sin, sin. That's also Christian persecution. And when you stand up and you call sin, sin, that's not being hard-hearted and mean-spirited. You're actually uh, doing somebody a huge favor when you do that. You know... God was talking to Ezekiel, and he talked about when he's putting the watchman on the wall. And the watchman, if he sees the destroyer coming and he doesn't say anything, that blood's going to be on his hand. And if you are uh, supposed to be telling people right from wrong and you don't do it, that is... Um, and you don't do it, and their blood's on your hands, that is really a bad thing. If you are get a chance to testify to somebody, tell them about the soul-saving grace of God, and the steps, the simple plan, uh, simple plan of salvation, and you get that opportunity and you don't do it, then their blood's on your hands. Okay? So make sure that you're out there saying the things that you're supposed to be saying, regardless what kind of feedback you get. Well, friends, good Lord willing, I'll be back with you next weekend.